and welcome back into another episode of the 100 Year Podcast. My name is Dario Strange. Here with me this week, Raul Su, the founder and uh, CEO of <laughs> Irreverent Labs. And our special guest this week is Linus Ekenstam. And he is uh, coming to us from Sweden. Wait, are you in Stockholm? No, I'm far down south, Malmö, close to Malmö. Okay, okay. He is the founder or co-founder of Bedtime Story AI, which is, well, I'll let you explain it. Can you explain like what it is? Uh, so Bedtime Story AI is a storytelling platform for kids and publishers. So it's a bit of a, a mix. You go in there and, and you can create stories short and long. Um, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a black box, but we're we've built it on top of multiple API providers, and then we have a little bit of our own secret sauce. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the short version. I, I discovered you guys on um, Product Hunt, and you, very popular on Product Hunt, a lot of good reviews. And I was just wondering, like, so you guys mentioned that you use uh, ChatGPT, or I think ChatGPT three. Uh, for one of your um, tools. Is, can you tell me like what you use for like the visual? Yeah, so um, we're, we're actually currently like changing a bit on the visual side. Uh, we've been using uh, different providers. We've used Dolly, Dolly 2. Um, we've been using like our own version of Stable Diffusion. Uh, and now we're switching to use Stable Diffusion XL. Uh, we, we've kind of like trained our own little model um, to, to, to actually improve imagery because like that's one of the things that we've been lacking in like the, 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 the styling is nice, but we want to improve it further. We want to give it more creative control. Um, and then on the LLM side, we've actually uh, made it so that we can switch. We're currently using uh, 3.5 from, from OpenAI and GPT-4, um, depending on the task. So we're kind of switching a bit, but it also works with uh, Claude from Anthropic, for example. So. We're, we're trying to be a bit agnostic. We're, we're, build, we're, we're slowly building out so like our infrastructure can kind of adapt to whatever comes next or you know maybe even in the future we'll, we'll try to like fine tune our own stuff. So we won't, we won't ever, I don't think we'll ever like train our own models, but like actually getting into the weeds of, of, of making the fine tuning better for our use case, for example. Well, and I have a, a couple of other questions that I'm sure uh, Raul does too, but first, can you like give us like a backgrounder? Like how'd you come into this? Like what's your kind of tech background, like where, where, where have you been? Yeah, Where'd you emerge from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny. Um, Well, um, f first of all, yeah, I'm Linus. Yeah, we, we, we go across that. Uh, I've been in, in the tech design world since I was 17, um, pretty young. Started as a runner at an agency. I'm 36 now, so that puts me at like, what, 19 years of experience. Um, and I think for the past 10 years, I've been working in startups mainly uh, as a product designer, uh, but also as a product person like head of product for a fintech in australia uh, i've been the principal designer at typeform.com which I, people probably heard of uh, and and my last position actually i was uh, the, the principal designer at flowdesk.com which is a mailchimp competitor so my background is in product design um, basically and um, i had a few early tries at building my own things back in 2011, 2012, I, I founded a, a startup that backwards engineered the Instagram API. Um, <laughs> funny, uh, but this was when Instagram only had like a few hundred thousand like uh, users, like 600,000. Um, and then we built some stuff with that. It went so, so I learned a lot, sold that in 2015. Um, yeah, it's just been like, I've been in and out doing my own things. And then we got tired of doing my own things. I got a job and then when I get tired of a job, I do my own things. So I'm now in the cycle of doing my own things. Um, that's a new way of the world. Yeah. That's a new way of the world. You know, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I was, I was going to say like, so I think you guys have like something like 5,000 bedtime stories already in the archive or has it grown? There, is, that, is that number? There one? are 30, 36,000 stories oh, wow. uh, in okay. the library. Um, we have about. Mm, now 22,000 users, 25, 23,000 users. Um, and in the early days, people didn't create a lot of stories and now we're seeing higher usage. So in the, actually we have a lot of users that don't have a single story for some reason. Um, but yeah, 30, 36,000 stories and counting. Uh, and we're kind of growing right fast right now. I think we're adding three, 300, 350 people a day, uh, roughly, which is good for us. I mean, we're bootstrapped. We're doing this kind of part-time um 
so yeah, we're, we're happy with the growth. We're happy with the numbers. Um, how, how many people are on your team? We're three. So we're three. We, it's like, we're all three founders. So yeah. it's me, yeah. Brian and my partner. So yeah, it's beautiful. Um, honestly, like it's a, it's such a cool product. Um, I like how it, um, like if, if you just sort of tell it what you want to, what you want to say, how it, it builds a story. So it creates kind of like anticipation for building the story on like traditional AI, which is very, it's like talking to a robot. <laughs> um, I also like how, you know, an image appears and that sort of thing. It sort of envisions what it might look like. It's pretty cool. It's a cool product. Um, I'd say like Brian has done a lot of, of the, of the grunt work there. He's been polishing a lot and he also spent a lot of time building adventure stories, which is like our take on Bandersnatch type stories. So you like, you can start a story and then you get like, as the first chapter ends, you can like take a choice and you can like pull in any direction. And we, yeah. Well, just uh, to interject, for those who don't know Bandersnatch, that's the Netflix uh, Black Mirror uh, special episode where you get to choose your own yes. adventure uh, by choosing yes, yes or no. And it, you know, depending upon your answer, it'll take you down a different path, right? Is that correct? Yeah. And like maybe even further away, like, or, or like if we're back reverse even further to the 90s, you had these books where you could like choose your own adventure, you get to a page and you know, like you want your main character to do X, Y, and Z, you go to like jump to page 192 and you continue to read there. So that's kind of the very, very old analog way of doing it. But that obviously has like a fixed ending or multiple fixed endings because it's like a, a tree and then it ends in specific ways. Whereas like our version is basically generated on the fly. So like we don't have a, there's not a fixed step. You, you, you can go on for weeks if you want to, or you can end it in like four steps. So it doesn't really matter. So that's something that Brian also spent a lot of time working on. Uh, we're, we still haven't really like figured out how to package it or make it into a thing or communicate it, but it will happen. And then another thing that we actually just released two days ago, it's a long form stories. We're calling it super stories uh, because they're really long. Uh, from a very short prompt, you can create like a, a 20 minute read <laughs> for oh, yourself. Wow. How many, um, what, like, do you have a word count on that? Like, what's the rough, oof, or do you, like, do you, three, spend, do you oh, say, 3,500, so 4,500 words. Okay, okay. Easily, like, yeah. So I wanted to get into how the product was created, but first I wanted to kind of make a note. Um, your product was, I feel, validated by something uh, Meta did, um, I want to say maybe a couple of years ago, when they were working on Portal. Portal was their kind of like home video conferencing uh, hardware tool um, for families to kind of connect. And I guess this was kind of like, they were hoping the, uh, the pandemic era would kind of like fuel the growth of that, but it didn't really happen. Uh, they've shut, since shuttered or shut down Portal. But one of the features was this, like a, a storytelling um, feature. And it involved augmented reality. And it was kind of like this way that you could kind of like craft, you know, bedtime stories or children's stories for, you know, for your family. So I remember looking into your background, like I was really, I, I like the backstory of like why you guys created this. Can you like tell us like what the reason was, the personal, personal reason? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I got two kids, right? I, I got a one-year-old and a three-year-old, two girls, beautiful, beautiful girls. And um, we read a lot to them, um, read every day, or plenty of books, we buy a lot of books. Um, but then we also make up stories. Uh, it's a bit of a, it, it is slightly com complicated. Like if, if I make up a story, then my partner, she doesn't really know exactly the ins and outs of the story. Um, and, and Jenny might then, you know, tell it differently. And then my oldest, she get angry and she's like, oh, that's not how dad told it. Um, or, or vice versa, maybe Jenny comes up with something and I don't know how to tell it. And I'm like, oh, there must be a better way to do this. And like, what if we just like <laughs> try to do something with AI? And then like, we could incorporate like learnings and then and experiences from their daily, daily life. So like my three-year-old, she's going through a lot and like, obviously like growing and there's, you know, she's getting more vocal and more communicative and there's, there's no, you know, going through life and if there is an event at, at daycare, for example, I can just like, hmm, we need to work on that. So I can just take that in, write a prompt saying like, hey, Skyler did this and like she got into a fight with X or that happened and what's the morale that we need to teach and like we can add that. And all of a sudden we have like a hyper personal, say hyper personal bedtime story that we can tell that also like helps her kind of establish and, and work through what she's done during the day. 
Um, so like that in combination with reading classic books and just reading in general, I think it's a really good tool. Like I wouldn't replace all the reading with just AI generated content for sure, but it helps us. And what's good then is like, we have that story. So Jenny can tell the exact same story or like at least keep it very close to that story. Cause we can just share that between us. Um, so yeah, the learning element I think is huge. Now, so, sorry, go ahead, Daria. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, what, what, what if you could add <clears throat> short films or, or sort of like movies to it? Uh, yeah, I think, you... yeah, I think that that's really like, so, so initially, like, okay, if we even reverse more, like, why did we choose bedtime stories? So like, if you look at GPT-3, for example, which was the LLM that I had experience dabbing in, um, there was constraints, right? Where you, you can't really do that much and keep a lot of consistency. Like, you can't do really long form. You can't really do elaborate stories with it. So, so that's kind of like, it set our kind of constraints. And then we we're looking at like, you know, could we do rhymes? Could we do this? Could we, do that? what's something that hits home with us? And like, basically, you know, with the kids and the problem that we had, we kind of got there. Uh, but the, the very early kind of like idea was essentially like, if we are thinking what the Netflix of 2030 would look like, how, how what, what is that company? Like, how do people consume content? Like, what is the content that they are consuming? Uh, that's kind of our North star. Like we want to be a narrative company. We want to do really cool stuff in the narrative space and then distribution wise, you know, if it's text, if it's images, video, audio, you name it, like we're basically just limited about like the current technology and what's capable. For example, now we can do audio stories and they're really good, but we don't really need to do much on our, on our like an engine for the story creation. Cause if it spits out text, we can get that text to turn that into audio. If we have the text, we can like create background um, descriptions for like the soundscapes and we can get that into audio. So like, we don't need much to go from that to do video. It's more like the limitations of the models currently, like, yeah, you can use gen one or gen two, but I think like ultimately we will end up in a position where maybe if it's not us, it's someone else that's gonna do like a 30 minute show based on like a very short prompt of what you want to see. Like, Hey, I'm, you know, I want to see this. I want these and these actors in this movie and I want to be in it, you know, boom. You know, a few minutes later, you have it, you'll watch it. You'll stream that on your, whatever you're, TV. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're definitely speaking to, uh, the, the, the right team for that. Like we're <laughs> actually, um, building, um, our own foundation model for creating short films using, uh, using pictures. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that like, you're the perfect team to develop on something like this. Uh, I love the fact that you're three people, you're really thinking about the user experience and what you're trying to create. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is the kind of thing we need in this industry is just like easy to use simple products that are beautiful. So yeah, congratulations. It's really cool. Thank you. This is yeah, the first time I've seen it, honestly, like a Dario, um, you know, he, he's really deep in the space and, uh, you know, he, he, he discovered it. Um, shared it with me, uh, you know, just before the call, and I started using it during the call uh, as well. So, yeah, it's 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 pretty awesome. Nice work. And, yeah. and by well, the way, yep. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, there's a ton of things coming out. We're currently kind of in the transition. We've changed the entire back end, and now we're kind of like slowly ticking away at the front end. So, like, there's a mix of like all the new all together, but like we 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 don't, you know, we're not we're not Facebook or, or any big companies. We don't really care if the user experience is like a little bit broken at the moment, because like we know that in a few weeks we'll, we'll be done with the transition. So I'm really very excited about where we're taking this, to be honest. Like I think we've done a really good job. So yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of like iron out the kinks. <laughs> and, and just um, to that, just a couple of last questions on the product. So mm -hmm. I like that you guys started out like it's not just a cool idea. You, you're starting out by monetizing it. So can you just explain like how that is like how you monetize the product? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, right now it's a SaaS business, like it's a SaaS model. So it's a monthly subscription. Um, we will move away from the subscription model. I think we're very clear on that. I think it makes sense. Like we didn't know in the beginning how to structure, how to structure it properly. Um, I think we're learning as the entire industry is learning that kind of credit based or usage based is probably the best way to go. Maybe there will be some low, 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 low amount to just 
you you have to pay this amount to have storage or you have you know, maybe it's a dollar two dollars whatever a month but then the rest is kind of usage based um obviously there's a real cost to using models right now and even though that, that cost is going down so hopefully you know we can like adjust our pricing as time goes because we're, we're not trying to like steal money from people here like the, the, we, we operate at really low margins even if it doesn't look like that but like it's really low margins our super stories for example i think like you know we, we're, we're basically just break even on them in terms of like if we sell them then yeah we, we don't we, we just provide that at cost basically with the hopes that like in the next six months maybe the the cost for us drops because like the models get cheaper to use and then we'll make money uh, because we we kind of like found a good position for pricing on that um but yeah i think we, we made a, a choice from the beginning to just people gonna have to pay for this we, we, we're not a you know we're not a charity we don't have the, <laughs> we don't have the money to spend to like bankroll this ourselves either i i, I understand why you think costs will go down you know with more scale and more efficiency on you know gpu compute and that sort of thing however uh, i don't know if you uh, if if you've been watching what's happening with uh you know regulation and ai uh but um i think that might actually make costs higher if people start to require licenses and that kind of thing to release um you know whether it's foundation models or something that's going to increase costs significantly um how do you think about that yeah, I think I think it's an interesting approach um, to, to to like yeah. It, at some point, there will be a cost layer added if 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 licensing becomes a thing. But then you have this whole other, you know, the the world is a big place, and I I I don't want to throw a stone in a glass house here, but like if the environment in one jurisdiction becomes not favorable for companies to operate in, if the environment becomes harder to operate in um servers everything we just move somewhere else the world needs to align and we can't even align like within a country or we can't even align within a a group of countries so i think it can be very di di difficult to solve um the, the compute cost however w there, there's no argue like we saw the price drop with 3.5 from 3 with 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 chat gpt right they reduced the price one order of magnitude uh, then they increased the price of GPT-4 by 20x. Um, so I'm I'm assuming they want at some point decrease the price of let's say GPT-4 by 10x again, like an order of magnitude cheaper. Uh, and if they do that, we make money. If you know regulatory space changes and there's licensing and there's all these other kinds of things added to it, price goes up again. Um, you know maybe I'll run my own foundation model or maybe I'll run my own now, GPT 3.5 is capable of doing a lot of things. And in five years time, it's still going to be capable of doing the things that it's doing today. And it's good enough for us, right? We might not need whatever. We might not need GPT 6. We might not need it for the use case. Or, 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 or who knows, maybe BARD will end up being, you know, really cheap. Like you just, you just never know, I guess. I, I think um, there are a lot of people that are thinking the edge, that the edge, like ultimately, I I don't, you know, if you, if you, if we look at technology, like, this will run on a personal device at some point, right? W whether it's in three years, when 10 years or 15 years, it doesn't matter. At some point, this stuff will run on the edge. It will run like a calculator. There's like, how often do you use your calculator, right? To do calculus, maybe once a week, once a month, depends on your job, right? But it's always working. Like it will be the same with an LLM. It just lives on, on, on a device, on your device. In the end, like I think near term, it's a bit more crazy because like we're, I, I wrote a piece today where like the number is like two and a half percent of the world's population have tried chat gpt 2.5 percent of the world's population that's nothing right um that tells us how early we are uh in, in everything so i think have this conversation again in 12 months and we, we like <laughs> we're all going to be more enlightened uh yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm curious you you kind of alluded to it uh earlier um regulations or regulatory environments so sweden is in the eu right i'm yes. i'm an american so excuse my ignorance yeah. okay yeah actually, no, no, i figured no you guys are in the eu so yes. people are already talking about kind of like the differences that there will be in um the uk you know brexit 
versus yeah. the EU. Italy um, made news when they at least temporarily banned, I believe it was ChatGPT. What you like, you said, you know, if the regulatory environment or you indicated that if it isn't yeah. um, favorable to, you know, these kind of AI businesses, you may, you might move. So you're saying you would move from Sweden to continue? I, I, well, it depends. Like the entity currently is an Australian entity just for, for, because like one of the founders is Australian. So like we're actually incorporated in Australia. Okay. Um, but it, let's say that there are rules here in Europe that, that would say that I wouldn't be able to build or that I would have to like do X, Y, and C. That's like outside of the already craziness of Europe, right? Like we have GDPR, which is like this, maybe you have some equivalent over in the US, but like basically the- It has anything equivalent to GDPR. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. GDPR, GDPR like, broke the entire internet here. Like yeah. I can't I can't open a website without having to like press a bunch of consents. Like obviously I can have a Chrome plugin that does it for me. But like the fact that the internet is broken in Europe is, is, is widely spread. Um, if they do something, they have the AI Act. I'm not exactly sure, right? I, I haven't read everything in it, so I'm not, I shouldn't make a statement on it. But at least it's not illegal. <laughs> And if they were, yeah. were to, like Italy, right? I think the reason why they ban it was like because of GDPR rules, because there was private information leaked. It has nothing to do with the fact that OpenAI operates an AI system. It was more tied to the other things. But if a country here would ban AI or like put really hard guardrails on AI, they would like sacrifice their country. That's how dumb it is to put hard like that hard regulations on this stuff at this point who who do you like in the eu who, who what would be the country that you i mean i know they kind of act in a unified way but yes. what would you which is the most startup friendly country in the eu um i think portugal is is very startup friendly um sweden is very i think sweden is very startup friendly but we do pay a lot of tax here um actually we Probably the tax well, pressure is more or less the same, maybe more, a bit, bit more than you guys, but we actually get stuff for paying tax. <laughs> so that's a right, different, right. <laughs> that's a different uh, topic, but, Instead but, of but missiles yeah. And um, stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're, well, if we can get into NATO, man, we're going to have to spend 2% of that GDP on, on missiles and bombs and whatever. But, but, but to the point, like, I think Europe is friendly in many ways. It's very friendly for startups. Um, even France and, and, and Spain are, are startup friendly. Um, I think that we are maybe a bit ahead in terms of like regulatory work on both um, I, like PI, like private, inf like private identity information and AI legislation. But I also think maybe if they were too early to, to regulate AI or like to, to draft the, the AI Act. So they might have to like, you know, because things are moving so fast, so they might have to just redo it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, we, we know regulators are not fast, right? That they're often very slow behemoths. So yeah, when they when they move, they you know they often don't know what they're doing. But I, I think you're right about Portugal. It's it's a good good safe choice. So that's yeah. the new uh, new home office uh, or or, <laughs> yeah. or, or uh, European uh, headquarters for uh, the Reverend Labs. Um, put that bug in your. Uh, so <laughs> earlier you mentioned um, stable diffusion. And um, mm. the founder, Imad, uh, recently announced um, Stable Studio, which is the yeah. open source version of Dream Studio. Um, I, and in his kind of like presentations online, he has mentioned like kind of, you know, because people have, you know, well, if you're going to open source all of your stuff, like how are, you know, how are you going to make money? And his model is to basically, they plan to create specific models for various clients. Overall, I'm just curious what both of you think as AI startup uh, founders, like what, like, is this, is, is his strategy, is stability AI strategy viable? Do you think they're going down the right path of this, this kind of like, we have our paid product and this open source environment to kind of get more exposure for our products? Uh, I probably have a completely uh, different opinion here on open source with AI, especially building a foundation model. I think it's an, it's, it's a complete mistake. Uh, it's dangerous uh, to go open source with these foundation models. Um, I think it's. I think that you know, if if there's any regulation to come out, the U.S. should be, you know, treating this like. I, and and you know, I have this conversation with David all the time, our co-founder, by the way. Um, and you know, he talks about us being a protected class. 
uh, because there's just too much uh, at risk. There's too much at stake when it comes to you know uh, releasing an open source model and then having other countries kind of compete without worry about regulation or even without sort of like the right guardrails in place with AI. I think it can get out of control very quickly. So yeah, personally, uh, I don't believe in open source on when it comes to these foundation models. I think uh, now that it's happening, I think it's just going to make the industry that much more challenging to navigate. So yeah, I would say it's a it's a disaster waiting to happen. Linus, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I have conflicting thoughts on this. I, I actually agree with a lot of that. Um, I do think. I do think we are, as a species, quite capable of of navigating hardships or like also kind of learning from mistakes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that it's all bad. The fact that we have the open source community looking at some of these, I mean, leaked models as well, like we have the leaked LLM from, from Meta. Because um, it, it gives the community a way to scrutinize as well. Um, but as you said, I think potentially the downsides um, might be worse than the upside. It, it is too, I, in my opinion, it's too early to tell. But but yeah, I do agree. It's it's a difficult one. Um, in terms of stability, though, and if their kind of like approach to you know open sourcing some things to then make money on on specific models, I think for them it could work. Um, because it will be lying, it will be in the fine, like in the, so a general model, this way that I see it, like a general model is like a, a brute force sledgehammer, right? You can, it's general, so it can do a lot of things and it has like, it has a capacity limit to what it's capable of. Whereas like, if I'm doing a model and I have a very specific use case, and we see this with Palm Med 2, for example, from from Google, that's like specialized in doing medical stuff. It gets extremely powerful and good at doing that, but it's not a general model. Like it's not like Palm 2, like it's a medicine general model. And I think we'll see more of that where, you know, these large foundational models are maybe the backbone or like the core, they're taking care of a lot of the heavy workload. But then we see like a whole plethora of like smaller, maybe in sometimes very specialized, also foundational models, but they're very specific to their use case. And in the case of stability, I think like we will see soon, I hope regulatory, even on Gen AI for, for images and stuff where, you know, data set protection or training data protection. Um, also like, you know, if you're Disney and you want to do your own, you will go to stability and Disney will get their own model, but it will be licensed to Disney and it's Disney's content and Disney can choose what data they want to train the model on, for example. Um, so for them, it might work, but the whole kind of, you know, open source or not, I'm actually like both agreeing, but also slightly disagreeing. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, we actually had here in the U S a big hearing in DC. Um, you know, we kind of like, I guess, dinged, uh, the European union and then their approach. Now it's, uh, the U S is turned on, on the pod. Um, so basically, uh, Sam Altman, and a couple of other experts uh, attended a big hearing. Um, let's see, what was it? The Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law. And basically, a bunch of senators grilled Sam Altman and and, and his cohorts uh, on you know where we're going with AI. And you know, one of the big takeaways for me it was like about three hours long. So most people haven't watched the whole thing. I watched it so you guys don't have to. I, I you know, went through the whole thing. And my big takeaway was that, um, and this seemed to be the senators were kind of surprised by this too. Um, and I'll focus on, on Sam Altman. Um, he's calling for regulation. Like he's asking the government to like, please get involved. And when one of the senators kind of like asked for specifics, Altman said something along the lines of, you know, there should be a licensing process for AI companies. And if you, I guess, run afoul of the guidelines of this license, that you can actually lose your license to, you know, basically, you know, do business, you know, as an AI company. 
in general, I mean, I know you guys, I'm, I'm assuming you guys haven't watched that whole thing, but just on that point um, from Sam Altman and OpenAI, what, what do, do you think that's kind of like the right direction, the right course? My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. Uh, I think that could happen in a lot of different ways. It's why we started the company. Um, it's a big part of why I'm here today uh, and why we've been here in the past and, and we've been able to spend some time with you. I think if this technology goes wrong, it can go quite wrong, uh, and we want to be vocal about that. We want to work with the government to prevent that from happening, but we, we try to be very clear-eyed about what the downside case is and the work that we have to do to mitigate that. <laughs> um, so, so Sam has been saying this for quite some time. So for me, it's like not a surprise. Um, I think OpenAI's stance has been pretty clear. Um, they want regulatory hurdles they like they want to work together to create they want to be part of creating the regulatory framework which i think it's easy for them to say when they're like you know the, the kind of the biggest one of the biggest players that are like in there now we've got microsoft backing them up like it's easy for them to sit and say like hey we're going to do this also puts a very good light on them um but i do think they're coming from a sincere place like i do think they want this for the better of, of everyone involved and for ai for the prospect of AI, their, their whole mission, right, is to like make it so that it's, you know, benefits all. Um, and if there are no regulatory guardrails, none, then it's going to be a wild, wild west. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be crazy. So I'm not surprised. Um, I'm a little bit kind of like the, 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 they went specifically saying that we want a licensing process. I, maybe, maybe not. I think it's funny um, when, well, there's a couple of different reactions to it. One reaction is it's, it's like going to the oil barons back in the day and asking them how to regulate the oil industry, right? Um, you know, they, they, they essentially gave Sam, uh, you know, full carte blanche to decide, like, or not to decide, but to suggest what type of regulations are required or, or should, be, should they consider. On the other end, you have these old dinosaurs like, you know, 80, 90 year old men who, who have no idea what they're talking about, trying to grok it and also ask sharp questions to look like they're smart. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, they're, uh, they're just, they're just creating noise for the sake of creating noise. And then when, <clears throat> when you look at what people in the industry are saying, the startups, exactly what Lennis is saying is, uh, you know, the, the startups are saying, well, this is very easy for Sam Altman to go out and and say regulate a space where you know he's the largest company out there so let's squeeze out all the potential startups that are coming up but <clears throat> there was one good suggestion uh or an interesting one anyways and it was on the basis of how much compute is required um you know to to uh you know if you, if you reach certain thresholds of compute then you should be regulated right and that threshold should lower over time based on uh, the fact that these models are getting more efficient and that type of thing so that was an interesting approach um, I do agree <clears throat> there needs to be regulation. I just don't know where that regulation comes from. I, I, I don't like the idea of Kamala Harris, for example, being the AI czar. Like, <laughs> it just makes no sense. Yeah. Well, by the way, I, I, mean, I just I, want to I, jump I, yeah. in real quick. Uh, thank you for that correction. Linus, not Linus. Uh, a, I'm a big Charlie Brown fan. B, Linus Torvalds is the biggest, yes. the most famous Linus I know. And so I should have known that. So sorry, Linus. Uh, no, Linus. no, it's, it's fine. It's um, fine, Linus. Linus. I have a warm uh, spot in yeah. my heart for Linus from uh, from Peanut. But um, but one of the representatives from Tennessee during the hearing made a point uh, about music. Um, personally, I just got access to um, Google uh, Test Kitchen, the AI Test Kitchen, and one of the features is this new music uh, AI music generation feature. Um, I haven't really tested it out. I'm probably going to mess with it, you know, earlier you know, or later this uh, week. Um, she, one of the points she made was just like, you know, is there a way to kind of, if, you know, music is created that mimics, let's say, like what we just saw with, um, I guess, Drake, you know, there'll be some sort of licensing or, or, or fee paid. Like she was like, she really hammered in on this and, and she didn't really get any great answers. I'm just curious if either of you have thought about this with regard, not just to music, but like visual art styles, cinematic styles. I have certainly, I'm sure Linus has as well. Um, I'll give you my thoughts on it. Um, basically, you know, the industry is freaking out right now. They want to shut it down. 
just sort of like the Napster days. Um, you can't shut it down. You know, m much of this is open source and it's out there. So you have these producers who are disguising themselves as AI Drake or whatever and creating music. Now the music is getting out there. What, what they should try and do is come up with ways to monetize it via like Spotify and other places. So if, if AI Drake wants to produce music uh, and put it out on Spotify, you know, those, those, you know, Drake should obviously get a big cut of that automatically or the, you know, the, 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 the company that owns the rights to his music. Um, there, <clears throat> there has to be a better way than just suing everybody and trying to put the toothpaste back in the bottle, which is going to be impossible. So, you know, eventually the industry will figure it out. But for now, there's going to be a lot of lawsuits. Yeah, I think Grimes actually, Grimes solved it. Like she, she made it, um, she just put an open letter, right? Or an open message. Like anyone that want to use my voice to make AI music, go ahead. Uh, the rules are 50% royalties to me, period. Wow, 50. There you go. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I mean, that, that, I mean, why not? Like, and obviously up to each artist to make their own decisions on this, but like, usually, like you said, there's like some company owning the rights to the music, but like, this is the approach, like the genius out of the bottle, like there's no putting it back. So I, I, Raul, I want to ask you a question though, just back on this kind of like, you know, if I was an AI Drake producer, like, you know, kind of like trying to pretend to be Drake, um, for me, it's tricky. Like I'm, I'm thinking not just music, but music, you know, film, uh, you know, writing, writing styles, like script writing styles or whatever. Um, uh, Ed Sheeran, you know, the big uh, pop star recently won a lawsuit uh, where, you know, they were accusing him of kind of sounding too much like a classic Marvin Gaye song. And he managed to win. But I remember like at one point he was like, if I lose this, I'm quitting music, something along those lines. You know, th the tricky part is like, you know, there's a fine line between copy and imitation or inspired by. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, if I decide to become a Drake like, you know, AI, you know, powered music producer or rapper, and I just kind of like tweak a few things, can I get around Drake's? Let's just say we're living in a, a world where Drake gets AI royalties from AI generated, you know, uh, outputs that sound too much like him. Can, can I just tweak my output to just skirt that i mean like it seems tricky it seems like this it would be kind of hard to really nail that down i mean you could certainly try but discovery would be interesting right like you know lawyers are going to be lawyers and you know at the end of the day um uh, a, a lawyer might sue you and 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 do this you know conduct some sort of discovery and um a judge is going to make a, a decision on it so you know i i wouldn't risk it i i would much rather try and work with the artist i think grimes did the right thing Although, you know, on Twitter, people sort of made fun of the fact that it was Grimes and nobody wants to make Grimes music, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. But it was, it, you know, she's right on with, with her approach to it. So, um, but yeah, like, could, could you not just take someone's voice and, you know, modify it somewhat so en enough so it doesn't quite sound like them? But, but the fact that you went through that process is enough intent, I guess a lawyer could say, you did this with the intent to use Drake's voice. So, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I agree 100% with, with, with Linus that, you know, we have to, um, uh, we, we just have to embrace it. It's coming, right? Actually, I think your, 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 your Twitter header says it right. Your Twitter header is actually a really great quote. I don't know. Did you make that quote? No, uh, no, I did not. It, it's a guy, Mitchell, um, made a documentary. It's from, oh, it's okay. actually a screen grab from the documentary, but I think it fits yeah. my entire take on this very well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, AI will not replace humans, but humans with with AI will replace humans without AI. I think that's oh, really yeah. really well said. Yeah, that's I think that's yeah. pretty much my uh, that's 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 what I, that's my refrain. That's what I've been saying. So, um, I want to say I want to say that like these are tools. Like we're not talking about sentient beings. Like, yeah, these are tools. These are just like very very powerful tools, and. Sometimes in history, right, we get powerful tools um, and things change. We invent a wheel or, you know, we invent electricity, we invent automation. Um, this time around, it happens to be artificial intelligence. Uh, it's dumb right now. It's like Tetris. If we compare it to like gaming, um, we know it will be better because it's easy to predict that it will be better. We don't know how much better it will become. 
but it's tools so far. Um, Can I just say something? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, while doing this podcast, um, using uh, bedtimestory.ai, I've written three children's books so far. One nice. of them is about a, a, a young child watch collector who couldn't afford watches and then eventually was able to. Another one is about a five-year-old drug dealer. Um, and then, and then the last one is about, uh, David, the robot, uh, the rise to brilliance. It's about my business partner, David. I mean, this is <laughs> so cool. And I think if people haven't oh, tried man. this, you have to try this. You just have to, you know, go, uh, try any one of these tools, but this is like a really, really great application that people should go out and try. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> and Thanks again, that's the... bedtimestory.ai, right? Yes. Um, so right. we're, we're kind of beginning to wrap up I have one last area I want to, uh, touch on and, you know, wouldn't be a tech podcast without talking about Elon, 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 <laughs> Elon. We always have to talk about Elon, I guess. Um, he just, uh, held the shareholders meeting, um, for Tesla, uh, recently. And just before the meeting, you know, he made a big pre presentation with slides and videos. But just before that, he had an interview with um, CNBC, the financial news um, network here in the States. And he talked about open AI. He, I mean, he really seems to like still be irritated by the fact that he's kind of not uh, participating in the open AI situation. And I want to read, like, I want to quote, uh, read what he said specifically when um, asked about kind of like why he's a little bit disturbed about open AI. Uh, this is um, Elon Musk. He says, what exactly is the relationship between open AI and Microsoft? I do worry that Microsoft may be more in control than the leadership team at open AI realizes. As part of the investment, uh, Microsoft has rights to all of the software, all of the model weights and everything necessary to run the inference system. So, you know, I, I guess I'll, pose this to you, Raul, first, like, what, like, do you think he has a point? You know, that is, is, you know, is he right to think that, you know, starting something as a nonprofit first, and then turning a lever and turning it into a for profit uh, venture when he invested 50 million in it, you know, originally as a not not for profit venture, you know, do, does, is he right to be a, a bit uh, peeved? Uh, and, and are his Microsoft concerns, um, full disclosure, you're a former Microsofty, um, you know, are his concerns yeah. valid? Well, look, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, as far as going from a nonprofit to a for-profit, he's, he's absolutely right. It's weird that they were able to just, you know, kind of do that. Um, you know, it, it feels like if that's totally legal, then, you know, he, he, he said it and he's right that that should be the default model for all companies start out as a not-for-profit, go raise a bunch of money from some rich billionaires and then, you know, turn it into a for-profit and you end up with a ton of cash and, and a lot of traction. Really, really strange. Um, secondly, with regards to the deal with Microsoft, the problem was that <clears throat> compute is expensive. And, you know, at the time when, um, when, you know, they, they required more compute. Uh, Azure or Microsoft was willing to make an investment to increase their network bandwidth and just really re change the whole network architecture, um, you know, around this new InfiniBand that NVIDIA has released recently. Um, Azure <clears throat> for public clouds has the fastest, uh, you know, public cloud for AI or the best public cloud for AI. Um, there's other companies that are sort of NVIDIA reference centers that also have a, a similar architecture that are like purpose built for AI. Um, but, but my point being is they needed the compute, they needed the investment because $50 million isn't enough to kind of, you know, grow this thing as big as they wanted to get. And, uh, Microsoft was holding all the cards. So yeah, you know, he's got a point, but Microsoft doesn't do things for free. And, you know, it was like a $10 billion investment or whatever for a, uh, basically a minority stake, a slightly minority stake, but they also get access to you know, like all first revenue comes to Microsoft, that type of thing. Microsoft basically owns them now. And I do find it odd that Sam has no equity in it. Um, like, I don't know what the structure was going in because it was a not-for-profit going to a for-profit. Um, you know, that whole thing just seems really weird. It seems completely backwards. So, so um, I might add, so the, the, the structure is is 
well, it's not that hard. They have everything on their on their website. You go openai.com slash our dash structure. Um, there's three companies. So you have OpenAI Inc., which is the 501c uh, public public charity, OpenAI nonprofits that wholly owns and controls um, OpenAI GP LLC that controls <laughs> the holding company, the, the, the nonprofit with employees and investors. And they are the majority owner of the for-profit company, OpenAI Global. And that is also the company that Microsoft is a minority owner in. Um, Elon helped fund and start the OpenAI nonprofit, right? The 401c, the, the 501c. Um, I don't know the beef between him and Altman. You know, I'm, I don't, I'm not friends with them. Um, but I think like he's angry, right? Because he's Elon and he's angry at the fact that someone else is actually getting a bit of limelight, I think. In, and that he's also like ousted out of the structure. He's not there anymore. He was instrumental to this, right? He was there. He helped, he helped get... Um, Ilyas, for example, on board, like say, you know, he did say open AI wouldn't exist without him, which is very uh, true. Yeah, it is very true, but it's also Elon, right? Like, yeah, the, the, the way that it's currently structured, it wouldn't exist without him and kudos to him. Like he's, he's doing a lot of things for, for, to, to develop a lot of advanced humanity forward, right? Like he's doing a lot of good things. Um, is the, is it strange that open AI needed 10 billion and they went to Microsoft. I'm not sure. The way that I see it is that they know if they don't, that someone else will. Um, and you only have one shot, I guess, at disrupting Google if you want to disrupt them. And who better to do it with like, than an arc enemy, like do it with Microsoft. Have either of you used Bard? And, and if so, what do you think like in, in comparison to ChatGPT? I've used Bard. Um, I got access a few weeks ago. I, I think it's good. I mean, I don't really know exactly what it is that different. Like, <laughs> well, I, I, I can mention one big difference and this is someone, something someone pointed out, um, on social media. And at first I thought it was kind of outlandish and then I, I tried it and it worked. Um, uh, if you are a news site with a paywall, you can actually go to Bard and at prompt it to read a summary of the article you know, that basically gets past the paywall. Now, uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, it may give you kind of like a fluffy summary, but if you know exactly what, you, if you're kind of like a category expert and you just don't want to pay, you can kind of like ask more specific questions to follow up that initial prompt and it delivered some of the results. I won't say which mm. paywall sites yeah. that I yeah. tried this on, but it absolutely worked. Um, this feels like shy, like early day issues, right? That you need a little bit more reinforcement learning, and 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 you need to tap those holes. It's like it's like the Dan mode with with GPT, ChatGPT, right? They tap that really hard. Um, so yeah, well, I, I guess I guess the thing for me that that's more important is that it's real time data versus this thing where ChatGPT kind of cuts off at twenty twenty one on a lot of questions yeah but now you yeah, have, you, you have internet bane. now yeah you have browsing now right yeah yeah like you can use the bane oh that's right know? when, did, when yeah. that's new though right when did that come out I well you have four yeah, yeah right? you can use okay. bing but you can you sorry you can also use like chat gpt now with browsing built in like if you're a plus if you're a plus user they're rolling it out this it should the rollout should be done or maybe not it's not maybe finished yet like it should be done by end of week so everyone yeah, it's a little toggle for like include web uh, yeah, so, so so that means like if you have yeah. ad web, it means that it has access to the internet, just like you can do you, you, you via can Bing. Be with, yeah, via Bing, right? Yeah, um, Bing. So, so it's it. I would say like and maybe I'm wrong, but um, I would say it's basically going to be like Bing, right? You know, using it, like what it is right now with with the uh, Chat GPT plugin or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and I've tried both. Um, you know, it it started out pretty pretty rough for Bard, but it's getting better and better, which you'd expect. Yeah. Um, Bard tends to have like fresher sort of like live content because it comes out of Google, but the, uh, but the, the AI itself is still better with, uh, with, with Bing slash, uh, chat GPT. So, um, yeah, but I, you know, the, the good thing is, uh, competition is here and, uh, and yeah. it's just going to, you know, make things that much better over time. It's only getting smarter. I, th I think we also like to point out that like the consumer in the end is like the massive winner here. Like 
I don't care if there's another five companies starting to compete against each other that, you know, wax in billions into this because like in the end, it's us consumers that are going to win because we're going to get better tooling and we're going to get like a better quality of life because of these new tools. Um, yeah, it's just nice to see that, you know, things are firing up on all cylinders really fast. A completely unrelated, but related last question. Um, in the same interview, Elon mentioned, um, and this is, I think, more directed towards you, Raul. Elon mentioned that um, he believes that Tesla will have its own chat GPT moment um, with its self-driving uh, feature within the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, do you believe that that will happen? Because he makes a lot of big promises that uh, often don't come to fruition. So. I, I do like I, I think I, I think what he sort of means by that is the the, uh, the 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 sort of global impact that it's had. So I have Teslas and you know I've seen the software sort of update over time, and I also have full self driving capability. Uh, often when I when I see somebody on Twitter sort of saying whatever Elon says is is full of shit, I, I say yeah I I I'm reading this while you know sitting in my electric self driving car that costs, you know, less than your RAV4 and, uh, and it's taking me to coffee, right? Like it's like a fully autonomous vehicle. Like you can say what you want, but, uh, and I don't mean you, Adario, cause I know you're an Elon well, fan. I'm thinking about yeah. Mars, like, you know, yeah. the, the, the date for Mars keeps getting pushed back and back yeah, yeah, and back yeah, yeah. and I haven't sure. heard anything. And I'm now saying, suddenly it's someday, but no, listen, I, I have like, I've been on the list for uh, two cyber trucks since the day it was announced on the ro I'm on the list for a roadster where I put a deposit down on that. I haven't heard anything about it. So, you know, I'm with you there, but I would say, generally speaking, um, you know, the, the amount of advancements they've had with autonomous vehicles and, uh, you know, the, the, it's a very advanced AI in, in, in that, in that car. I, I would say, yeah, I, I think he will have his chat GPT moment with uh, uh, with autonomous vehicle driving for sure. So wait, you're, you're on the list, uh, you're on the wait list, uh, Linus, for a Cybertruck? Yeah, I bought it like, oh, I bought it, I put the reservation in like five minutes into yeah. the show when you could do it. And I've been on the, I've been on the wait list ever since. So no, wait a do minute. You, like, do, you know, do, you, do you know what number you are, by the way? I'm yeah, I checked it. I actually checked it. Uh, I checked, <laughs> yeah. it. I checked I, it today, actually. Yeah. Well, let me ask yeah, you a question, like, though, like with regard to like, you know, I don't want to get too political here, but with all of the kind of, I guess, uh, public profile issues that he's been that he has had in the last whatever, I guess, since he took over Twitter, mm -hmm. if, you know, your friends in the EU see you driving around a cyber, you know, in a cyber truck. You know, do you think that sends a political message or they don't care? It's just a cool they car. I mean, if, if I look around the neighborhood here where I live. 90% Teslas. There you go. There's the answer. Okay. It's like Sweden, Sweden and Norway. It's like the Tesla fucking center of the world. Sorry for swearing, but it's like everyone is driving a Tesla and everyone's everyone buying a Tesla. Like he's, the, he's the god of Sweden with that truck. For sure. <laughs> yeah. It's a big car though. So I'm not, I'm not sure in the end, I'm not even sure if they're going to, you know, are they going to do a European version? Is it only going to be the North American version? We don't know. Like I'm, yeah. you know, what, what did I actually order? Like, I have no idea. There's no communication. Actually, Elon, if you ever hear this, like, where's the communication? Like, I well, something. Well, during the shareholders meeting, he did uh, kind of give a little update on on the Cybertruck. And, and another event. open question that people have asked, uh, particularly in Asia, is, you know, kind of the current Cybertruck is basically just too big for a lot of roads, mm. let's say in Japan. And, you know, Japan has a, a lot of Tesla fans. And so I'm just uh, there's been, you know, questions as to whether they might produce like a smaller you know, cyber trucks specifically for Asia markets. So I guess we'll just have to wait. He did mention two new cars yesterday. So who knows? We'll see. Right. I mean, will, will, I those, cars be, will, will the, those cars be cheaper or will they be more expensive? I imagine that he's going to do a two series that'll be cheaper. Um, yeah. But the, but why would you go more expensive than this than the Roadster? Right. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. No. We'll see. He also he alluded to the numbers, right? They they think between the two models they will make five five million a year or something within a couple of years. Um, yeah, I think he said no. Th I think he said a quarter of million. The the goal is a quarter of a million cyber trucks per year. That's the no no. Goal? I mentioned the new car. The new car. Oh, the new the car. Day, okay, but, uh, I'm still on cyber truck. Right. All right. Yeah, no worries. And, and and another thing I just want to mention, I think like people are laughing at at Optimus, uh, and I'm not laughing. Like I, yeah, I think, am I. well, let's explain. No, 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 Optimus guess... is the humanoid robot that Tesla rolled out at, I guess it maybe six months ago. He showed it off the last time, a few mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah, 
What yeah. you were gonna say? I'm and sorry. They, they well, they they made it public like a year a year half ago. Like they, they said, like we're gonna make an we're gonna make a robot. Um, and people are laughing. Um, and I think it's it's really not dumb at all. And I think the ratio that you know we, you know Elon numbers, but like the ratio one to one and one to two um, makes a lot of sense. Like if I can have a robot that does a lot of things for me, I want to get one. I get two. I don't, you know, why, why not? Um, I also think I alluded to this in my piece today where I'm like, you know, if we're going to do, if, if all the things that we're currently doing, like work to survive. And I, you know, a lot of people in the world work to survive. Like that means to an end is actually to put food on the table and shelter over their roof. And that's the majority of people and why they work that will, I think completely go away within my lifetime. Like the need to do work to survive will go away because of technology advancements. Then what do we do? We become a leisure species or we, you know, our desire to solve harder problems might increase, you know, together with AI, we might be able to like look at really, really difficult problems like faster than light travel or teleportation or, you know, the or question of origin. Um, I think building a humanoid robot is not a bad idea. And I also think there are many companies now trying to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, Elon did make a little quip about it yesterday. He said something like, um, you know, this without the Terminator uh, is, is, <laughs> is like, you know, it's, it's like, as soon as it turns to the Terminator, then we're all fucked basically. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. I, I, I'd buy one. Uh, you know, I just keep it away from any weapons. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that problem here, but like, yeah, I mean, well, you do have knives there. I mean, imagine, <laughs> you know, Optimus with knives. Like, you don't know, right? So, maybe, maybe yeah. one, one, one of the Star Wars uh, robots, this is a rotating hands. This is like, yeah. a knife. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's actually the plot of one of the uh, uh, Black Mirror episodes where uh, there's like the robotic dog and then it loses, mm -hmm. the, it loses its guns or whatever and it starts going after the woman with knives. So that mm -hmm. was pretty scary. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would like to say, like, maybe, maybe the god plux, the god, god complex in humanity is like, why do we cr create a robot in 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 our picture, right? Like, why do we make a bipedal robot with a head and arms? Surely there must be some more optimal form for a robotic um, body. But it's funny that we do, and it, it, like for me, it kind of alludes back to the fact that life imitates art, and whatever we've dreamed up whatever the sci-fi authors, authors before us dreamed up is now our generation trying to fulfill those fantasies. But I'm more excited about understanding what my kids are going to dream up when they start to fabricate things of their own. Um, because just me, I've grown up from like having access to an Atari to like having fiber in my house and now AI, whereas my kids, they start on AI their atari is ai <laughs> like where where will it end for them and like what are the dreams and sci-fi of their generation that they're going to try to solve and i think that's very very more interesting than the stuff that we're currently trying to solve that's a perfect uh note to end on uh to remind people to check out uh bedtimestory.ai um do you, do you have any like social media channels or any other uh areas for people to go check out well for me twitter like linus ekenstam uh on twitter wait wait wait, wait did you just say linus yeah <laughs> so it's but it is linus, linus. so it's <laughs> no. not linus it's, Li it's linus. Li linus okay linus. Yeah, all right okay so i influenced you the american influence no you yeah it's like right. yes linus yeah uh so it's uh, my name l-i-n-u-s e-k-e-n-s-t-a-m uh on twitter and then i write a sub stack that's uh called inside my head but it's also just my name l-i-n-u-s e-k-e-n-s-t-m uh, dot sub stack dot com Awesome. Linus, we'll be uh, we'll also be in touch with you in the future about our upcoming foundation model. And like, to do so. I'm, I'm looking forward to to, yeah. to have a chat. It was a great chat. Yeah. And speaking of uh, Substack, you can check us out at um, the hundred year or hundred year lens at Substack. Um, and if you want to subscribe uh, and please give us a, a nice review, um, you can go to hundredyear.com and that'll take you to every podcast platform: Apple, Spotify. So give us a share, give us a like, uh, and on YouTube, uh, whenever you can. Uh, thanks again, Linus. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>